storage. So this won't be recorded unless you free up. Robert, free up storage. It's already started. Fine. Sorry for the delay, everyone. Thank you. We hope the wait is worth it. I'm sure it will be. We've got an amazing meet in Monaco to discuss. A world record by Faith Kipiega on 407 by a woman in the mile. Yes, it's real. Uh, national records galore in that race. Nikki Hiltz gets the American record, an Irish record. We had a British record. We even had a Venezuelan record. I'm going to break that down in detail. Another men's 5,000, another terrific race. Hagos Gebrewet back from the dead, 1242, personal best at the age of 29. He's only 29 years old. That's what the database tells me. Kind of crazy. He gets the win there, fast times all around, except for Kupatia, who went for it, fell out, fell up, came up short. Terrific 400 hurdles by Carsten Warholm. He's putting together a season for the ages, his second Diamond League record of the year, 46 51. He gets the win. Alessandro Santos falls apart the last 100 meters. We may have a new star from Kenya in the men's steeplechase, Simon Koech. The Kenyan trials champ looked very impressive in his first race outside of Nairobi. 8.04 for the win. 14 second personal best for him. Sharika Jackson takes home the women's 200. The showdown with Gabby Thomas never really materialized. Gabby Thomas just did not have it at all that last 100. Instead, it was Jackson and Julian Alfred, the NCAA champion from the University of Texas. Close for a while. Jackson pulls away, gets the win there. And we had a world leader in the men's 800 by Wycliffe Kenyamal, who will not even be at Worlds this year. He only finished fourth in the Kenyan trials. He won't be on the team. Guys, what else am I missing? I hope you enjoyed this meet as much as I did. It was Monaco. Mondo Duplantis got beat in the pole vault. I mean, that was a big deal. So, yeah, a lot of fun. What were you guys' reactions? The biggest reaction, John, you're not even saying why we were late. It took us a while to... We flew to Monaco for our signature birthday. Weldon and I had to meet together. We had to come outside to the ocean front here. Just kidding, folks. We're not in the ocean front of Monaco, but we are celebrating a signature birthday. Remember, Founders Day is on Monday. Big discounts. I may just walk off into the wilderness. This may be my last. Well, I've got a wife and kid in the sport. But it was a fun meet. I mean, not Monaco right you know you every year you know it's going to be great and this was fabulous i think at the time when i saw the women's mile world record i mean i'm watching it with my 75 year old plus dad doesn't normally watch track and he's like look how far ahead that woman is i was like yeah she's incredible and there's six people behind her setting national records and she's destroying them but at the time i was telling my dad i'm like look that's she set three world records this is way better than her old records. You know, with the women's time, you take about 20 seconds off. And it's like, no, she's running so fast. What's interesting is, you know, a 342, 1500 is a four minute mile. It's like 17 something seconds. This time actually converts a little bit slower than her 349, 1500 meter world record. So, but it was still super, super impressive. It's just wonderful to, to see that race with, her world record, and then six national records, I think five area records, continent records. John, you had the stats. Yeah, we had seven national records, I think you said. Yeah, I'd have to look at our recap. But Kenya, Ireland, Great Britain, Australia, USA, France, and Venezuela. And then you had continental records for Africa, North America, Australia, or Oceania and south america so four continental records the thing about this result like on the broadcast steve cram was like this might have even been even better you know it's because she smashed this world record but i, I do want to put this into context a little bit the women's mile just isn't run very much at the elite level you get maybe one a year if that and this race had almost everything you would want to put together a fast time. It was at Monaco, which we know is a fast middle distance track. But why is Monaco a fast middle distance track? It's because you get all the stars showing up. They want to run fast. And it's usually about a month out from Worlds. So they're all coming close to peak fitness. That's what we had tonight. We had very good pacemaking, not just from Kip Yegon, 
But basically, Laura Muir acted as the second pacemaker for this chase group because you had Kip Yegon, you had Fruwaini Hailu, who bravely tried to go with Kip Yegon for a while, faded and still hung on to run 414 for third. So props to her because I think she would have gone a lot faster if she had run a little bit more evenly. But then you had this huge chase pack and you didn't have any pacemakers there. Someone had to take it on. It was Laura Muir for most of it. And she was rewarded with the British record. This was a nice, I mean, in some ways you're like, okay, it's a nice return to form for Laura Muir, who was beat at the British champs. But also she got fourth. She was beaten by Sierra Kira McGinn. She was beaten by Fruwaini Hailu. So, you know, I think you've got to be happy with the British record, but fourth place, whatever. But yeah, you had a bunch of different things coming together for some really fast times. Nikki Hiltz, American record, 416.35. That takes down the mark of Mary Decker Slaney, 416.71, set back in 1985, so nearly four decades ago. So congrats to Nikki on that one. And Elise Cranny would have had the American record if it wasn't for Hiltz because she ran 416.47 in eighth place. So fast times all around, but yeah, Kip Yegon... I mean, she's the goat. And I guess the thing, like 407, when I see that time, if you use the comparisons, like Robert likes to multiply by 1.0802. I don't know why you multiply by that extra 0.02. It adds like a tenth of a, you know, not even a tenth. It's like 0.01 of a second, whatever time you're making. But for some reason, that's John Kellogg's conversion of choice. So we use it. But essentially, it converts to either a 349 or a 350 if you're going by World Athletics for 1500, which is phenomenal. But we've, we've seen Faith Kip Yegon do that earlier this year. She ran 349.11 Monaco. So it's not like this is an unprecedented performance, but you've also got to remember 349.11. I'm sorry, it wasn't Monaco, it was Florence. That is almost a full second and faster than anyone else in history has run for that distance. So you're basically saying, yeah, for Kip Yegon to run 407 today, she would have to do that again. One of the greatest performances in the history of middle distance running and she'd have to replicate it. And she did. So props to her because it was phen phenomenal. Yeah. 350 is now like what she runs, which is crazy. When you see a woman there with 407, like I don't, as you said, John, they don't run it very often. I'm just like, what? 407, like nearly beating a world record by five seconds. It's just hard to make sense of. And she is so far ahead. I mean, what does Nikki's time convert to? That'd be interesting. And you like that battle there, Nikki and Cranny are essentially 0. 0.12 battling it out for American record. And like, you don't see them. They're almost, I mean, they're not a hundred behind, but it looks like a hundred behind. They're, they essentially the straightaway behind. I mean, it's not quite the full straightaway. Just shows how damn good Kip Gun is. But you think, oh, 349, she can't come close to that again. She did. I think she pretty much can probably run under with good weather. I mean, maybe you need pacers or lighting or something, but. She's going to run into 351, seems like, whenever she wants to. Right. That's the crazy thing to me and the most impressive thing. It's not just how fast it is. It's that she's able to replicate a what was already a historic performance earlier this year in Florence. And the other thing, Nikki Hiltz, you asked, you know, what would this convert to? Well, Hiltz came through 1500 in 359.7, which would be their first time under four minutes. So, and at least Cranny was 359 flat. Uh, 1500 and she you know faded a little bit at the very end but for hilts i would say it converts to 358 maybe 357 high what do you think robert well, give me the time i can do 1.0802 right now so we've got <laughs> 41635 256.35 i can see this why johnny's putting in the 0 0.02 <laughs> virtual 0 0.02 357.32. And if you don't put the 0.02 in there, you get 357.36. What was the difference there? Point of like 0.04 of a second. So, we're all yeah. about and let's run. Well, so, look, I mean, but the big quick picture for me is uh, amazing runs throughout, but does it really change anything for Worlds? And I think the answer is no. Kip Yegun's going to win the gold. Even with a fall, I think she could probably win the gold. That's how good she is. And the question is, who gets the silver and the bronze? If Sege runs this event, I think she gets the silver like she did last year. Well, we don't know what Hassan's doing. So Sege, Hassan, I'm assuming, are better than anybody else. 
and then it's kind of a, a wide open. I would assume that even without them, the next I've got a bunch of Ethiopians. So it's, there's going to be three Ethiopians, right, John? They don't have a fourth entry, do they? No, they do not. It's only three. So it's going to be Kip Yegon. Then I would say whatever three Ethiopians end up on the team would be my favorites for second and third. But I don't know who that's going to be. And what's interesting to me is Fraiwani Hailu, who was, what, third here today? Will she even be on the team? She's run 357.65, which is 10th in the world. But Ethiopia's got Sege at 354, Mesheshu at 354, Burke Hylam, the teenager, at 354, Jeribi Wateja at 355 flat. That's better than any of these times that we saw here. Um, you know, and, and then Hylou's at 357.65. So even if they convert this time down to a 1500, I assume she's probably a little bit slower than that, right? Yeah. I think what we're going to see at Worlds, Robert, is similar to last year. Kip Yegon, handy victory. And then the battle for silver and bronze is probably going to be between whichever three Ethiopians get named to the team, whether it's Sagai, Meshesha, Hailom, Wilteji, or Hailu. Well, and, and Hassan. If Hassan runs the 1500, she would be in that mix as well, I think. So, what's kind of interesting is. You basically have Kipiegon, 349.11, then Sagay. You basically have one, two, three, four, five, five Ethiopians in a row. I guess McGeehan's in there. So McGeehan can get a medal. Muir can get a medal, medal maybe. But as, as good as Nikki Hiltz is, I think it's going to be tough for the, for the Americans. And one way to think about Hiltz's performance today is Hiltz almost got beat by the, by the U.S. 10K champion. That's how good Elise Cranny is doing this year. Yeah, I mean, Elise Cranny, I don't think it's crazy to think she could have made the U.S. 1500 team. I think she would have been right in the mix. Uh, she finished right behind the U.S. 1500 champion. So, great run for her. I mean, it, these records, they were saying it beforehand. Steve Cram did a great job of hyping it up, it up. Or, you know, on the start line, he was saying, the Irish record stood since 1994. Sonia O'Sullivan, legend of the sport. The British record stood since 1985. Zola Bud. The American record stood since 1985. Mary Decker These are bold-faced names. And all of those records got broken. The world record got broken as well. So that's how fast they, you know, they with super shoes, you know, we always got to bring that into context. Like I had a DM from a prominent trap person immediately after that. All 13 people in this race pers ran personal bests, but super shoes aren't the only thing here. It's just, it's, it's rare that you get an elite mile with everyone in really good shape and gunning for a fast time. And that's what we got today. Right. And I'm no longer the bitter old man. I, I, I was, when, when they first came on to the scene in the marathon, I didn't like it. People wouldn't acknowledge it. I thought it was almost mechanical doping sort of to give it to some Nike athletes, not other Nike athletes. Now I kind of think it's cool to the times, but I, I do like, we, we saw it last week when the Irish record in the 5,000 fell for the Washington guy. Help me out with his last name, John. Brian Fay. Brian Fay. I mean, come on. Like Brian Fay has, is not even scoring at NCAA championships. Alistair Craig, whose record he broke, is a seven time NCAA champion is an absolute stud. So, you know, it, it's cool to run faster than them, but, but you know, it's it, it's just not the same thing. All right. John, some, I think it's Thomas Lester here in the comments. Essentially says, can Nikki Hiltz get the U.S. women's mile record? I think people, and he says serious question. And I think it's sort of interesting. I think it should, I think Nikki will take this record, but from a like philosophical standpoint, someone who doesn't, identify i think as a woman i wonder what nikki will call this record right like it's sort of an interesting concept she always competes or they always compete in the women's mile so in my book when it comes to running i mean she, she fits my definition of a woman so i don't know sort of interesting philosophical comment but well we, regardless we, we have to do it it's a damn quick time she, she, nikki's now low 357s a lot of progress from her this year. Them, yeah. Working. I mean, she made a world team before. 
they but now Nikki's at a completely different level. Yeah. No, they've been terrific this year. Clearly the move to Mike Smith has paid off. And I think, I don't think anyone should doubt like it's just, this is like, we call it the women's category and we were having the discussion on the podcast earlier this week. Do we just rename it? Is it open and female or is it XXXY? I, I don't know how you do it, but we break them down, but we break the categories down by sex because that's the best proxy for these massive different differences in testosterone between the two sexes. Nikki is competing in the correct category and yeah, it's women's and that's not what they identify as, but they earn this record. I, I don't think there's really going to be that much of an issue. I, I will be, I will be interested to hear from them to see sort of what they would like to hear this category called. Like is women, are they okay competing in the category named women's? Should it just be called female? I don't know, but they're the new record holder. And you know, I don't think there's a debate about that. Yeah, we could say the philosophical debate, whatever you want to call it, later. It's sort of an interesting concept, though. But that's for the social scientists. For the track and field fans, I think the vast, you know, 95% of us should find calling it the women's mile record. Great run by Nikki. And even better run by Faith. And I, Nikki's still, like, on the outside looking in. I mean, what place is she today? Fifth, sixth? When you think about a medal at Worlds, it, as Robert said, nothing's really changed in my book. No, it's a huge long shot for Hills. Uh, it's just, they're having a great season. It's not like a shot at Hills. It's just the level is very high in the women's 1500 right now. You've got the greatest mile of all time, Faith Kip Yegon. You've got Hassan. You've got Sagai, who are world champions in other events. Hassan's a former 1500 world champ. And then you've got this crop of Ethiopians who's just running... Who, a bunch of them just ran 354s. So when you are 357 in your best day, it's just going to be very, very hard to close that gap if we get a fast race at Worlds, which if Sagai's in there, we almost certainly will. Uh, yeah, I think it's going to be fast enough that Hiltz just isn't going to be in contention at the bell for a medal. Yeah, if Kip Yegum lets it go slow at Worlds, I just don't know why you would. Blasted from at least eight hundred to go. It should be way ahead. Well, I don't understand. I don't understand why Laura Muir likes to do all the work. I was her. I'd wait a little bit. I mean, Jay Scotty, man, here's got a good question. The question remains unanswered, though. How will Kip Yegon do at Worlds when there are no Pacers? It's the same question with that we have with Jakob. I think. What? 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 What do you mean? The question remains unanswered. Have you guys watched track and field? Did you watch the Diamond League final last year? Kip Yegon let it go slow and just blasted everyone. She's she's got the best kick in the world too. She just doesn't use it very often or doesn't need to. Like, did you see how she destroyed Gade in the five k? Do you see her kick in Paris? Oh, sorry, in a in um. Florence, like she's the best kicker as well. It's just she's been going for fast times. It, it's not an unanswered question. Like Kip Yegon would win that race too. She won world titles in 2016, 2017. Those races weren't crazy fast. I, I can't believe Walt thought that was a good comment. I think it is a relevant comment. And championship race is still a different thing. Like if she lets it go super slow down to one lap to go, but lets more people have a chance. She still probably wins, but. She won the Olympic, the 2016 Olympic final. She won it in 408. She won it by more than a second. And that was, she wasn't as good as she is now. It's it, like, it's, there's no question about this. She would smoke everyone a kick as well. It's not even comparable. It's it, Think about it I mean, literally from a guy's standpoint. Does a four minute miler lose to a four minute oh five miler if it's slow? No, they still win easily. I mean, what's her 800 PB? Oh, now you're turning it to Robert Johnson here. I think it's like, I mean, she she's closed 800s in, she's closed 1500s in like well under two minutes. But I, officially her 800 PB is 157.68. But I wouldn't actually be surprised if she's run faster at the end of a 1500 at some point. Well, I would be. All right, let's keep this show rolling. I think from a distance perspective, the next highlights, the men's 5,000 meters, right? It's the Wait, Ro Robert, Robert, 
I just want to say 2016 Olympic final, Kip Yegon's final 800, 157.3, which is faster than her open PB. So I knew I remembered that from somewhere. Well, then, men's 1500, we can talk about the men's 5K. I just want to say, like, Kip Yegon can kick, all right? What if she lets it go? To, what if she waits to 100 meters to go? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, what if she waits to the last meter of the race? Well, yeah, maybe she's vulnerable then. We should pay a bounty. We'll give her, like, you know, raise a bunch of money. If she, the later she passes the person, you know, if you wait to like one meter to go, we'll give you a million dollars. She just sit right behind him and do it. Hi, right, men's 5,000. Another record breaking performance. I think for the first time in history, three guys ran 1242. The winner, Hagos Gabrahiwat, 1240, excuse me, 12, um, 1242.18. Berhu Aragawe, 1242.58. Kelahun, Haile Bekele, 1242.70. And this was epic in the sense of they went out super fast. They were like 737, I think, at 3000. That's low 1240s pace. You're thinking if they kick, they could possibly set the world record. But what happened here was in the fourth kilometer, it slowed like it normally does when there's no rabbits. And not a surprise for me. This race was run in, in, in 84 degree weather. Like I was amazed that they were running this fast. I guess John's going to say it's not hot. 80 degrees. Like what was the world record when they ran it? No, I mean, 84 degrees is warmer than you would want for a 5k. My question to you guys, Jacob crop took the lead with about, as soon as the pacemaker dropped, essentially like right about 3k. And he kind of slowed it down. He was still running like 1259 pace but he was running 62s and he needs to be running 60s or 61s to get the world record. Do you think if crop doesn't show up that Aragawi or Kip Limo, the guys who've been closing super fast in these races, do you think one of them would have taken it and tried to run 60s or 61s? Cause to me it was like, Oh, they saw crops leading. They're just like, all right, we'll let this guy lead. Like, do you think they were holding back and just let him do it? Or do you think it was, they just couldn't hold that pace. I think for Kip Limo, it's the ladder. He got dropped, but Aragawi, I don't know. I kind of agree with you, John. I think if Crop hadn't taken the lead, they probably would have run faster. Because I got excited. The announcer was like, Crop to the lead. I'm like, taking over. I'm like, oh, we're going to see a fast one. Someone's willing to sort of take this up. But the pace is so fast. Like, I don't know. I think you can run be running 62s and it still feels kind of quick. And then you've totally lost the ball game. So I think that's what happened there. And then basically the pace slows. And then with 600 to go, Hagos Gabriela went, went to the, to the lead and ends up, I mean, I, I was yelling at the TV ends up winning it, you know, narrowly 1242, 18 to 1242, 58 to 1242, 70. And what I was worried about is, and I, when he went to the lead initially, I was thinking, Oh, he's doing this because he knows that he's got to go in on time. Ethiopia picks the 5,000 meter team on time, and you've already got, you know, um, Kajelcha at 1241. You're going to have to really roll here. So I, I was just thinking he was trying to make sure that he got it on time, but maybe that's the best way he, he does it. But you pointed this out, John. I mean, this guy is officially 20. Nine or is it 28 now? It's 20. Official, according to World, the World Athletics, he's born on May 11th, 1994, which would make him 29. So 11 years ago, he was in the famous Paris Diamond League where 11 men broke 13 flat, six men broke 1250. This record, this race was just a little bit faster. This set all time places, t- times for places in three, four, five, and six. But he was in that race. He ran 1247. Um, he was second in it, and here we are 11 years ago. I mean, the other guys are all basically out of the sport. Dejan Grezer, Mexico, Isaiah Kowicz, Yanu Elmer, Thomas Langosiwa. And it's amazing that he's still doing this at this level. I was really pumped to see him get on the team. I was also worried that they were going to knock Yomiv Kajelcha off the team. Kajelcha ran 1241 in Oslo, but he's still in the top three now. So what's interesting is, Bekele, who runs 1242.70 today for third, right now is not going to Worlds. He's fourth. 
My only concern is, is it possible Kajelts has hurt John? He hasn't run since Bislett? Or did he think there's no way anyone's going to beat me with 1241? Which is crazy because he was pretty close to getting beat today. Yeah, I don't know about Kajelcha. I think there might still be a window for Bekele to get to Worlds because Aragawi is also in the 10K team. He won their 10K trials. Ethiopia generally doesn't like their athletes doubling. So it is possible if he runs the 10K only, then they would have a team of Kajelcha, Gebrewet, and Bekele. But yeah, it's pretty wild that you run 1242. It's probably, that's got to be in the top 10 all time, right? Like thinking 5,000 meters, 1242, that puts you, I think, ninth now on the all time list. And yeah, it's not enough to make the world championship team for Ethiopia. Well, well done. Oh, following me over here. What's interesting to me about, about um, Gabriel Hewitt is, you know, he used to run that VA 5K. I would see him. And people like, you know, when he ran that race 11 years ago, he was 18 years of age. People like these age cheats. And he looked old. His face looked a little bit weathered. But we don't know what these African guys do. All we know, you know, Pierce to say about Haile and Kipchoge, no way they can run that fast when they're that young. Well, look at what they're doing 20 years later. So in, in this case, it's like he may have been that young because we know that he's, he's still kicking ass 11 years later. So I just thought it, it was a wonderful run for Hagos, really Ethiopia going one, two, three. I was pretty stunned by Caplimo in the sense of I, I was just wondering before this one when there was talk of world record talk, five minutes before I went to the message board, I'm like, do we see a world record? And if so, who gets it? Is it most likely to be Eric Galway or Caplimo? And I was thinking maybe Caplimo gets this world record. Maybe he's the next Gab, the next Gabber Selassie. I don't know if you want to count Farah in that category, even though he wasn't the time trial like them. I was thinking this is already the half marathon world record holder. Maybe he's just going to take it to a new level. And I was wrong about that, obviously, because, you know, it wasn't like he ran terrible. He's six and twelve forty eight seventy eight, but it's just going to be a, a fascinating world because if you want a medal, these guys are so evenly matched. And on one week, somebody can be better than the other. There's a lot of really good guys. It might be best to do a little work, sit on the rail, use no energy, and then kick. But if you do that, you're probably handing the gold medal to Mr. Ingebrigtsen. So. The other thought that I had about this race was I see them going out super fast. I'm like, wait, Cooper Tears in here. Where is he? I look up. He's waving the back in red. But my brain likes to think creative thoughts. I thought, is there any chance Cooper Tears gets the American record in this race and finishes way off the pace? Like we get a 1235 world record. Well, I guess Fisher's now in the 1246s. I was kind of thinking the old record was like 1250. The answer would be a big negative. 1319 for Mr. Tear today. I mean... That's not good, but I think it's hard for him to run in 80-degree heat. But that's the problem is everyone else is running in 80-degree heat. The pace is probably too hot for him. But if he's unhappy with Jerry, this performance is going to make him unhappier, right? Yeah, but it's, I don't know. If you're Cupertier, I I don't fault him for what he did at all. Like You don't fly over to Monaco to run to, to be conservative. If he went out, tried to run under 13 minutes, uh, couldn't hold on. Maybe the heat had something to do with it. I don't know. Yeah, obviously it's not what he wanted, but I respect the guy for going for it. What I will say, you know, it's kind of interesting. Jakob Ingebrigtsen, his European record was broken in this race. Mo Katia finishes fourth in 1245. But we got an answer here. Katia, I, I was thinking going into this race, if they don't drop Katia, there's no chance any of these guys are dropping Jakob in the 5,000 meter world final because Katia is basically a poor man's Jakob, the way I see it. Similar skill set. He won that big race in Florence in 12.52, but this one, the winning time's 10 seconds faster. Katia can't hold on. He still runs a PB, but he gets dropped. So they shook Katia, but my question to you guys, has anything you've seen on the Diamond League circuit with all these winning times in the low 1240s, do you think any of these guys could drop Jakob in the World Championship final? Or do you think even if it's in a low 
12 40s he's strong enough to hold on and outkick him all i'm feeling better about Jakob's chances after this one not exactly sure why maybe like kip limo was so good last time he wasn't that great this time i think running this pace is very hard and i think when it comes to it on the day of is there going to be a team plan or who's going to sort of be the sacrificial lamb to just try to ram it from the front? I don't know. If there are, especially if Aragawa's in the 10, I think he's maybe the most likely candidate. His run was the most impressive of, of these. I guess we've had three fast ones and a fourth pretty good one. Like he was the guy who like led the longest and got the win. So I think that's the model. If you want to try to pull it off at Worlds. Um, I... I Am I convinced Jakob would have won this race today? No, I'm not. I, th- I think he might have struggled in this race. Mid-80s, 83, 84. Well, he won the world title last year in like high 80s in Eugene, right? It wasn't a tour over the time. Was it even? I mean, it was like 1302 or something, right? I mean, this, is, he's mu- this is the type of race. He's much more vulnerable in a rabbited 5,000. He's much more vulnerable in an unrabbited 1500. But if, if you yeah. flip those, he seems almost unbeatable to me. But I, I'm not, he's run 1248. But do you remember when he ran 1248, how he did that, John? He was dropped in the middle of the race. And then he just kept running even splits. They slow down the fourth kilometer and he out kicks everybody. But there's a difference between 1248 and 1242. Last time I checked, you know, you think, oh, only six seconds? That's like 50 freaking meters, man. That's a lot. Yeah, but that was two years ago. I think Jakob of 2023 is better runner than a stronger runner than Jakob of 2021. I think I'm still picking Jakob over anyone else in this race because here's the other thing. We always talk about, oh, team tactics. Well, they, how many times do we talk about team tactics trying to beat Mo Farah? And how many times did it actually come to fruition? I think the Ethiopians kind of tried it. Gebra Meskel tried it in the 2016 Olympics and no one else wanted to take over with him. I think if we're going to see a fast pace at Worlds, it's going to be because someone like Aragawi just says, screw it. This is my best chance. I don't, I don't care about team tactics. My best chance of winning is just try to, you know, ram it from 3K to go. So I could see that happening. But the idea of someone signing up to be a sacrificial lamb in a world championship final I just don't see it. I think it's going to be a guy who thinks they can hold it all the way if they try to run a fast pace. Yeah, this isn't like the El Garou situation where like the other guy from Morocco is clearly not at the le- same level. He sneaks into the finals like, okay, I'll rabbit it for you. I don't think it's going to happen. There's a good comment here in the, in the chat saying uh, Aragaro and Gabriel Hiwa, like that combo, probably all of the Ethiopians, they might be the most interested, like, okay, it's in our interest, so let's try to work something out. I could see something like that happening. Um, but we, we can always make this just the Jakob show. Quick question, just fifth, quick answer. Where do you think he's more vulnerable, the 15 or the 5? I don't know if it's a quick answer, though. It's a tough question. I. I want to say I will. I kind of want to say the five, just because I haven't seen him run it enough this year. But I also don't see him. I don't know. He just looks so good in the fifteen hundred. Yeah, it's tough. I don't know. For me, which is he more vulnerable? I like a chance in both. I'm gonna say the five. He's not a lock for either one for me. I, I would have definitely said, well, at the beginning of the year, I would have definitely said the 1500. He's getting to the point. Everyone thinks that I'm saying he's not going to win because I'm pointing out, you know, these stats and stuff about how the favorite, the fastest guy doesn't, is only won 33% of the time in the last 15 years. I, I think he's more vulnerable. Why no? Because I don't think anyone's going to team up and push it in the five. So, God, I think he's going to win both. I do. But I would say 1,500 still at the most. I, I, it depends know. on how these races play out, right? You know, you don't know well, what the kind of race it's going to be in the 5K. The thing, it's like the rabbiting. Well, I say it's suicide to push the pace in a 5,000 because you're going to lose. But Jakob's going to have to push the pace in the 1,500 if he wants to win that, I would think. 
So, and he's never run that fast, and he's never had this deep of competition. So I think the five's the answer. A couple other things. Okay, Mo look, Ahmed. Wait, comment here. John Murray says Rojo is still salty. The Jacob Blue Office patient question. I actually, there was a guy on the message board who who kept pointing this out. I don't think he blew it off. I think he may have thought, "Wow, what a brilliant question! What journalist <laughs> asked an interesting question like that? Like, that, that's not your normal one of the mill question of like, how do you feel after winning? Do you have another race before world? This was actually a thoughtful question, so, Robert. If that's what you thought, he thought you don't read body language very well because that is not what Jakob was thinking. Uh, I'm just, I, I didn't think that initially. Somebody posted it up there. You know, it could be lost in translation, guys, from another country. Okay. Guys, I got to get going here and enjoy Monaco like Sydney McLaughlin. I mean, these trips to Monaco are well, they're quite common for her without racing, but it's, it's quite hot here in Monaco. So let's keep the show rolling. Mohamed, 1301, only 1256 PB. The Bowerman men on the track continue to struggle. Jimmy Gracier, national record for France, 1256. But let's keep going here. Is that the first? Oh, wait, no. I'm just going to say, is that the first European born athlete to break? 13, but definitely not. I think because <laughs> ba- ba- Dita Bauman did it and Jakob did it. I mean, it was a stupid idea. Mokatia, I think Mokatia might have been. Was he born in Spain as well? Yeah, I think it's. No, he's born in Morocco, but yeah. Okay. Let's go back. Let's, let's, switch, let's switch events. The first the first mid day event on the day, men's 800. Marco Arab goes out in 49. I keep waiting for this guy to win a medal because he's so talented. I'm not sure. What, what do you mean, Robert? You said this last time. The guy won a medal last year in Eugene. He did? Yes. Oh, <laughs> well, good for him. Glad he finally. Anyways, he gets run down 143.51. Wyckoff, Kenny Ma, 143.40, 143.22. Two Algerians get second and fourth. And, you know, it's just. I think you can throw a blanket over these guys. I do think the Algerians are good at kicking. I'd be surprised if at least one of them doesn't medal at Worlds. But there were so many guys within striking distance. You just got to see, you know, what happens at the end. You know, I mean, Joseph Dang, who's run 143 this year, gets next to last. Clayton Murphy was right there at 600, gets dead last. But dead last... Although, John, you sometimes use the word dead last. Should we just say last? Or is dead last making it sound even worse? No, dead dead last is if you're like a clear loss. Like if he was battling Deng for ninth place, you just say he's lost. If he's dead lost, it's like, yeah, you know, it wasn't close. Well, and he, he was okay, lost so, by over, almost a second. So he was dead lost today. You know, Pop, he was dead last. He was almost a full second back. One, But he, the good news is it was 145.83. But... Fast race up front. I mean, Bryce Hopple seasonal best, right? 143.95. I mean, six guys break 144. But I, I just think with Worlds, it's going to be pretty interesting, right? Like, Emmanuel Career, who's won the last two global titles, is not running well. As I said, I'm not totally ruling him out because you don't need a lot of fitness for 800. If, if he can get his foot not hurting, maybe he could do something, but I'm not counting on it. And then... I don't know. Is Kenya Mall the favorite, John, because of this? Kenya Mall's not going to be at Worlds. He was fourth at the Kenyan trials. He didn't get named to their team. So, I mean, maybe Athletics Kenya pulls an old switcheroo. It wouldn't be the first time. But, you know, he, he's been good this year, but he didn't run well at the trials. So, I don't know about him. What I was shocked by was Emmanuel Wanyonyi, who had been incredible to this point. He won in Rabat, won in Paris, won the Kenyan trials. He's just sitting in the middle of the pack in this race. I'm waiting for him to move up. I'm like, what is he doing? What's he doing? Never came. He finished eighth in 144.35. So going in, I would have said, this guy's the guy to beat at Worlds. Now, yeah, hell if I know. If you, like most of the top six in this race outside of Kenya Mall, they've all got a shot to win. Uh, If you make the final at Worlds, you're going to think, hey, I might have a shot to win this thing because I don't think anyone... I mean, maybe when Yonyi, if he gets back to his best, I could see him kind of be like, he's still 18 officially, so he might just be the next great one in this event. But yeah, I think for the other medals, it's going to be a battle royale. This was a good return to form for Bryce Hopple, his fastest time since 2020 when he ran 143, also in Monaco. He's only broken 144 twice in his life, both at the same track. But he was only sixth place in this race. So... You know, you take like some progress, but there were other good guys. Daniel Rowden, the Brit, the British champ, 143.95 PB for him. A-Rop, 
I, I was surprised how well A-Rob held on. When he got passed, I thought he was really tying up, and he still held on to run 143.5, so good job to him. And Mula, like you said, he can kick. So I was a little surprised he didn't come up, come up on Kenyamal, but if he's close in the last 100, I think he has a decent shot to get a medal. But yeah, it's, I think it's good. The 800 is... It's interesting when there's no. Some people will say, "Oh, it's a little, it's watered down when there's no clear favorite." But it's a bunch of guys just went for one forty three. I don't think it's watered down. I just think there's no overwhelming number one guy. Yeah, I thought Hop will be like. I'm like, oh, he did whatever. No, it's the second fastest time. This guy's medal or almost medal the world's in the fourth place. So, I mean, Kenyon Mills won six Diamond League events in his life. He's not going to be in a Kenyan team this year. But I think that also shows to me running worlds with rounds is still different than this. Bryce Hopple is very under the radar. I still hold, hold out help for Clayton Murphy. Both those guys show they can do it for the rounds. But we could be looking at Bryce Hopple's season very different a year from now. I mean, any one of these guys, to be honest, right? It's like it's that wide open. I expect Career to do nothing. I expect him to do nothing last year, but I'm, I'm even more confident this year. So that's just sort of how I view this. I expect Wanyoni to bounce back, but... All right. Men's yeah. chase. Wait, wait, wait. Well, one thing about the B heat. I mean, I didn't oh. see this, but we, we, we have a former podcast guest running on that. Niels Laros, 18 years old, 95 days. A 144 PB to win the B heat. So his PB coming in was 145.80. This is the kid that's run 332, 145.80, 748, 13.23, and he runs. 144.78. So congrats to him. One other thing about Cooper Kier, I, I was wondering, you know, was he last? No, he was not. 13.19, he was third to last. But he beat someone by the name of Samuel Tafera. This is the guy that won World Indoors in the 1500 last year. Beat Jakob, the Jakob Slayer. But I, it's kind of interesting because I viewed them as similar in the sense of Tafer is the world indoor champ, but I find it interesting that he's been trying to run the 5,000 this year. So his coaches, even in Ethiopia, I mean, I guess it, we can go back 50, 60 years ago. Coaches are always seeing these guys. They don't have the super fast speed. And they're like, look, you're going to be a 5K guy. And the guys are like, no, I'm a miler. I'm a miler. Even the coaches in Ethiopia are trying to bump Tafer up, or maybe he's trying to do it himself. He's run 12.58 and 13.02 today. But when you're in a race, when they're running 12.40s, it's hard. and He runs 13.22. So... It's just interesting, sort of, the guy's sort of not sure what event he is, also runs poorly today. Well, Tafara is just somehow a superhero indoors. He won World Indoors in 2018. He won it in 2022. He's never made a final outdoors. 2019, DNF in the semis in Doha. 2021, first round at the Olympics. Last year, he was ninth in his semi in Eugene. Like, the reason he might be trying to f move up is because he never does anything in the 1500 outdoors i don't understand you throw a roof over his head and he's be beating yaka but outdoors he's, he's nothing it, it's baffling frankly i don't i mean the 15 i don't think he's i think he's sort of like well i mean tier did kick out kick everyone at usa so that's usa used to win last year i think to ferris sort of like cooper tier he's not a classic 1500 meter guy like with, with the change of speed maybe i'm being unfair to cooper tier but there's just something about how these guys are that i don't know like I don't think the 1500 is their best event, even though they're both very fast at it. And I've had, you know, success. Well, I mean, you're a world indoor champion. It's like, you know, what level are we evaluating things on? Two-time oh. world indoor champion. And he won very different races. One of them was 332. One of them was 358. Like, it, I, yeah, I don't, I don't get it. So someone's saying a weird decision by Isaiah Harris to run the sound running meet in LA tomorrow instead of Monaco. So we have sound running tomorrow. Don't forget to support the cause. But, is that true? Why would we assume that he would get in this meet? I'm kind of assuming he would not be able to get into this Monaco meet. That's what I assumed. I mean, he did beat Clayton Murphy at USA's, but I think I, I would have been, I just assumed Isaiah Harris would have run Monaco if he got in and he didn't get in. But I, I don't know 100% on that one. All right, men's steeplechase. I was excited about this. And midway through the race, they, they were talking about how. Kibawa of, of, of uh, Kenya was the favorite. And I was like, what? Do they know what they're talking about? I'm, I'm, I was all into seeing Simon Koech. 
This is a teenager. The is he still a teen, John? Or am I making that up? Twenty years old, close. And you know, I'm like, this is the youngster that won the Kenny Trials by a lot, four or five seconds. He's never won in Europe. You know, in a steeple at this level, I'm like, what can he do? And his form was just smoky smooth, silky smooth. I mean, just looks so wonderful. He only had an 818 PB from 2021 coming in. And that's when he won the World Junior Bronze Medal. And his form was amazing. He took off, ran a big PB, got the win. Um, 804, right? Yep. And was super happy to do that. 804 doesn't surprise me for him. I don't think he can challenge these guys. That, you know, we've got the world record holder. We've got Elba Kale. I don't think he can challenge them for the win. Probably a year or two away for that. But I do think Kenny's got hope for the future because he was super impressive. Winning by yeah. over five seconds. No doubt, Robert. No doubt. Uh, this was going to be a big test for him because it was his first time competing in a track race outside of Nairobi. Now, officially, Lamecha Goma is only two years older than him. Uh, Goma is 22 and Coach is 20. So, it's not Goma might be around for a while as well, but I was very encouraged by this. I think he has the potential to go faster. Like you said, he seems like a natural for this event. It's going to be interesting getting him against some of the big guys or into a, a tactical race. Like, is he going to be able to kick? How is his closing speed? Because that's what wins medals a lot of the time in these global finals. We've seen it with Kip Rudo. We've seen it with El Bacali. But yeah, I think in a year or two, he could be exceptional. And right now, I, I think he's got a shot at that bronze medal because after the big two, El Bacali and Gummer, I think that spot was fairly open. So very encouraging run. Did you notice he was kind of channeling Kemboy when he crossed the finish line? He did the sort of point at the camera. It was like, oh, this guy's got a little personality as well. Uh, I think it's great. I'm excited to see more Simon Coach in my life moving forward. But uh, do we see the PRs behind him, John? I do. We've got Anthony Rotic, your boy, second PB of the year. After not PRing for 10 years, he's now run two PBs this year. 8.13 for him. That's an almost three-second PB. Mason Furlick PB'd, 8.16.03. So the two Americans who didn't make the team both ran personal best in this meet. The guy who did make the team, Bernard Kida, Dead lost in 829.61. He was five seconds back behind second to loss Olympic champion Conceslas Kibrudo. So that qualifies as dead loss for Kida. And then fifth place, Robert, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to give too much credit to Dathan Ritzenheim. I know you're careful with the coaching stuff, but a good run for the On Athletics Club, George Beamish, 813 Oceana record. I mean, 813 in your first season running the steeple, that's that's pretty good, right? Oh, it's impressive. He ran 8.42 in his first race. Now he's down to 8.13. So congrats to George Bemis. You know, he, he, I think this is a good event for him. He's not strong enough for the 5,000. Was he, was he on 8.30 pace to the bell and kicked really well? You know that? <laughs> right, it's getting kind of hot out here. We were late today because we wanted to see backdrop to act like we're in Monaco, even though we're not in Monaco. So this whole thing's just a bit like it could have been on time for all the listeners, but you wanted to have the. Yeah. Well, I don't understand. Weldon didn't even show up at this Airbnb that we're at for our birthday until like one minute before we're supposed to go on here. Other events though, Amanyala wins the sprint over Tobogo, 992 to 993. Uh, just the 100 is going to be wide open at Worlds. Um, Warholm, 46-51, Diamond Ring record. He's super impressive. Dos Santos, you know, I'm just pleased that his season's not over. Like, 47-66 is not terrible. He beat C.J. Allen. Um, Mondo loses the pole vault. I think that's good for the sport. I mean, I would like to see an Edward Moses-type streak, but he lost last year, so get, like, 100 in a row. But the intrigue is good. Jaden Hibbert, the young NCAA star for Arkansas, got – robbed of the, of the triple jump win. I don't like how they don't let the, the guy with the best mark go last, but um, Zango beat him 1770-1766. But some women sprinting. Some, some, Sherika Jackson wins, wins the showdown with Gabby Thomas, but it wasn't even a showdown. Gabby Thomas was terrible. 2267, pretty shocking. Sherika Jackson, 2186. Just a lot of these events, I like 
you know, I, I don't know what to think. This to me though means I'm putting Sherika Jackson as the favorite. I would say for the 100 and 200 because she's so consistent. She's gotten the peak right. We're not sure if Shakari's going to get the peak right. She just bombed her last race. Gabby Thomas has bombed her race here. You got Shelly Ann Fraser Price coming up on top. I'm not seeing the Americans can't do it, but I'm definitely got the Jamaicans as the favorite. Yeah, I think I have Sharika as the favorite in the 200. 100, I mean, I don't know. If Shelly Ann runs in the 10 sevens, she's racing again this weekend in Madrid. If she runs in the 10 sevens, I might put her as the favorite because she's got the championship pedigree. But it's weird. Like, I'm not expecting everyone to have sort of the best race of their lives every time out. Like, I'm not saying Gabby Thomas, oh, she ran 21.6 in Eugene. She's got to be like 21.5 here. I, 21.60 is historically fast, but she wasn't even within a second of that time. You know, when she came over to Europe earlier this year, she won Paris 22.05. I, mean, I guess you see the LA meet back on May 27th. I'm looking at the results. She only ran 22.85 there. So, I don't know if they're just in heavy training or what. So, I mean, something looked off. She was just not competitive, uh, especially over the final hundred. So I don't know what was going on with her. Wait, I mean, the but, second up is crazy when you think about it for 200. Like, is this true? Thomas ja- Thomas Luster in the chat says the right before the start, Sherrick and Jackson and Gabby Thomas switched lane. Did they? I would love to see that. Let's get the Zapruder film out there because. That would be great. I've always wondered, like, you know, I have a late scratch, just move the people out. But I'm like, oh, it's hard for the timing people because they've got to move you in the lane. Otherwise, they're going to get the wrong results. So the timer would have to see that and, like, think, okay, lane four is second place. But really, that's lane three and have to move it. It, it, it. You can easily screw up the results by doing that. All right. One other thing on DeSantos, I respect him for trying to go for go for it. It reminded me of last year's World Championship final, actually, except Dos Santos was playing the role of what Warholm did last year. Last year, Warholm wasn't 100% fit, tried to hang with Dos Santos through 300, fell apart the last 100. This time, Dos Santos still coming back from his injury, meniscus surgery in February, was close to Warholm 200 meters in, and then the last 100 just faded. It didn't have it. And Warholm's in close to the form of his life right now. I mean, 46-5. Him and Dos Santos last year, the only two men to ever break 47 three times in one year. So I think the world record is not out of the question in the world championship final. And I do think Benjamin could push him because Benjamin ran 46.62 at USA. It's not far behind what Warholm ran today. Question is... Benjamin said he wanted to get paid. Classic Americans. No wonder why he did across the world. Because I realize, like, I don't like the Yankees and the Red Sox. They just buy all the talent and still can't beat my beloved Baltimore Orioles. But, like, the Americans are like, oh, we're going to race this race, and then we don't show up. Rye Benjamin pulls out and doesn't race. I didn't hear an excuse for it, but he was on the short list, correct? Well, no, his explanation, he at least was like, look, I didn't race for two months. I was injured. I show up at USA's. I ran three races in three days. If I'm going to put my body on the line in Monaco, I need to get paid a big appearance fee, or I'm just going to focus on making sure I stay healthy and not overstress myself till worlds as a track fan. I want to see them race, but he at least offers an explanation. What kind of annoys me is like, I don't know, city McLaughlin, the Vroni, they type her up and she's running. And then Bobby Kersey. I mean, how many times have we heard Bobby Kersey or Sydney say something like, Oh yeah, it's a minor little thing. We saw Bobby saw something in the warm up. He pulled me from the meet. This happens, I feel like, in the New Balance Indoor Grand Prix. It happened in New York last year. It happened in L.A. I mean, that wasn't a warm-up. That was a week in advance. It happened. She withdrew from Monaco last year to run the Hungry Meet. It's just, I guess when Sydney McLaughlin Lavroni shows up for a race, you kind of just got to put that announcement in pencil because I feel like she's the one. she scratches at the last minute for more races than anyone else in the sport. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, at some point, if you're Monaco... I hope she gets no appearance fee. But you're not going like, to make her pay the money back. She's still the best in the world and you want her to come back. But it's sort of, it's like it's two important. years in a row she's there, like sort of a spectator. It's like, come on. And I, I'm wondering, and this is wrong, but at some point I'm almost wanting, wanting her to get beat. But like, let's say she's kind of banged up next year at the Olympics. Does she start and get third? Or does she rather just not beg out and keep her sort of unbeatable reputation? 
in tech. It's starting to annoy me. But our intern Alex was like, the shoe company's not care. I'm like, dude, you've just been following sport for a few years. Like, no, they don't care. But it's not any different than any other sport. Does anyone care if like Patrick Mahomes loses in week seven in the NFL as long as he wins the Super Bowl? That's what you care about. I mean, yeah, the undefeated streaks and the 17 and 0 Patriots, which never happened, and you know, the Miami Dolphins from 1972, maybe. But other than that, it's about the big one. It's in all sports, and there's not a lot we can do about it. But the difference is, if Patrick Mahomes has some minor knee issue, he's not going to not play the game in week eight. He'll still play. And I get the incentives are different in track and field. Like, you need to win a certain amount of regular season games to make it to the playoffs and get the number one seed and track Sydney's into Worlds. But it's, you know, it's a fan... The preseason doesn't matter, but I just saw a Wrexham, a fourth division soccer team, play Chelsea with 50,000 fans in the United States. So apparently U.S. fans will come out for preseason. But speaking of England, we have the London Diamond League on Sunday. And Yerdegus is the favorite for the 1500 in our book. And we should have a stellar men's 200 meters. That's still on, right, John? Well, we got you saw we got another withdrawal the other day, right? Arian Knighton's out. So now we're just down. It's Zon L. Hughes, Noah Lyles. We do have Alexi Agando, who beat Knighton earlier this week. But yeah, Knighton's out and Curly's out from the initial names a week ago. I was hearing you talk about this race on the Tuesday show. It'd be interesting to me. My, my gut instinct right now, I think even the goose has passed his peak. I don't think he's winning this race. I hope I'm wrong. What evidence do you have for that? Somebody passed him in the middle of the USA 1500. Okay. 150. I, I, I had Steve Holman flashbacks. You, you've been just, I don't know what Steve Holman did to you, Robert. Were you just the biggest Steve Holman fan? Like you've been making these comparisons yeah. to Nagoose. Nagoose made an Olympic team two years ago. He's been amazing all this year. He hasn't, he won NCAA titles. Like, he hasn't shown – I don't understand how you just keep making this comparison even Which though Nagoose is giving you no reason to do so. I said Hacker – I mean, I said uh, – not Hacker. Uh, Hoare and Romo should leave the OAC and, and be coached by me. By the way, Cooper, if you need a coach, I'm here for you. Because they're never going to beat Nagoose. What I think is more likely that Nagoose wins this race or Hoare or Garcia Romo beat him. At some point in their life, I think that they're going to beat him at some point in their life. There you go. Wait, was Cole Hawker always in this race? I didn't remember seeing him on the start list, but he's on the start list now. So I'm even more excited. This is awesome. London. Okay, there we go. That's what we have to look forward to in London. Also, a comment here in the chat. The Brojo is looking more alike than ever now. Is Rojo losing weight? Oh, my God. This means I haven't been running really in like a month since the baby's here. I must be putting on I think Weldon's probably putting on the weight. Folks, wow. remember Monday... Founders Day, big sale on Let's Run. Be sure to hit the website. I got to go. I'm getting hot. If you like this as a live show, you'll like it even better as a podcast. You want to listen live. Let's run.com slash subscribe. Thank you to all the supporters, club members. John, thank you. Thank you for everyone joining us here in Monaco. I almost passed out here in the heat. Whatever this temperature is, it's not even 90 degrees today. Oh, my God. So I'll give Cooper wow. to Rojo Coaches and to 2028 Olympic gold medal. You're a real New Englander now. I thought you were from Texas, well then, but the Texan in you is dying if you think New England summers are hot. All right. Hope you enjoyed, Monaco, everyone. We will not be doing a live show for London on Sunday, but we'll talk about that in our regular show next week. They'll drop Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. So maybe we'll be talking about Yara Nagus's first career Diamond League victory. Who knows? Give me a podcast. All right. First place, Texas Rangers. And orange.